good if they don't want to go by. They're saying I better read them. Yeah. Yeah. Folks yeah. sitting out here. Yeah. I said to them back we get read. Yeah. Yeah. You don't get over there and behind me. How? It's freezing in here. Yeah, I'm just out, man, but this side of the room is really yeah. cold. <laughs> And I don't get very cold off, but I like it cool, but not this cold. <laughs> I guess somebody turn it down, uh, take it off too from here. Probably so.
Kyle, you good? Yes, sir. Good evening. Welcome to Oconee County Board of Commissioners meeting. Today is Tuesday, May the 2nd, 2023. If you join us virtually to comment during the public comment portions of the meeting, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. After a moment of silence, we're going to ask Mark Saxon to lead us in the pledge to the flag. Please stand. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, first time of business will be to approve the agenda. I will ask that we remove item 7 1, the joint use agreement with the Board of Education, to give us a little more time to work on that. Uh, so if we could get a motion to approve the agenda with that deletion. I make a motion to approve the agenda as submitted with the change. Second. And we have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Our next item is uh, statements and remarks from citizens. This is for anything not on the agenda tonight. Anyone virtually? Any statements or remarks from commissioners? Mr. Chairman, did you? have a chance to verify that DOT meeting. I did not. They have they have reserved that location, but I have not confirmed with DOT that's actually going forward yet. Okay. So I uh, just want to make the other commissions aware I found out that the DOT was having a town hall uh, about the 316 quarter changes at the Bogart Community Center on May the 25th at 4 p.m. And uh and it, I just found out about it just Quite by accident, we haven't gotten any communication from the DOT. So if we do get some, if you could confirm that for us, yes. Chair, I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in attending that. I would think so. So I've reached out to the project manager for that. Uh, have not heard back yet, but they did reserve that location. Just there's been no publicity on it yet. So okay. I don't know if it's a firm date yet or not. All right. So, yeah. Thank you. I do want to remind everybody that to May 1st started the burn ban. That'll run through September 13th. So no more burning your leaves and limbs. Our next item of business is to approve the minutes. This will be from our regular meeting on April 4th and the agenda setting meeting on April 25th. Make a motion to approve the minutes as submitted. Second. Okay. A motion second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. We're now going to move into our zoning matters. Um, rezone petition, petition shall be presented by the staff with no time limit. Those wishing to speak for the rezone will have a total of 20 minutes, less the applicant's reserve, for, reserve time for rebuttal. And those wishing to speak against will also have 20 minutes. After that, the public comment section will be, be closed and the board of commissioners will have an opportunity to ask questions as they find appropriate. And then we'll make a decision based on uh, as set out in the Unified Development Code. So with that, we're going to call Rezone P23-0087, Zoconi County Board of Commissioners, B1 to B1 and B2, 42.76 acres on the southeast corner of Highway 78 and 53. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, again, this is P23-0087, um, located in the western portion of the county at Highway 78 and Highway 53. Tax parcel is A02025HA. It's currently zoned B1 in the Civic Center character area. And again, this request is pursuant to the settlement agreement with Don Hammett in the case of Hammett versus Oconee County. The Oconee County Board of Commissioners is initiating a rezone of the subject property from B1 General Business District to B1 and B2 Highway Business District for a mixed use commercial development. This is a settlement agreement concept plan. Uh, that's in your packets. These are the architectural images submitted with the application. And the uh, five recommendations, uh, we have uh, our standard one, two, and three recommendations. Uh, but number four, at its expense, the owner shall construct all transportation improvements recommended by the traffic study completed by A&R Engineering dated 5-18-22, or as otherwise approved by Oconee County Public Works Director. 
Number five, an internal sidewalk network shall connect all uses within the development to sidewalks along rights of way. Pedestrian connectivity shall be provided throughout the development, including raised decorative crosswalks. Final design of the sidewalk network shall be subject to the approval of the planning director and shall be shown on the preliminary plat and site plans uh, for each phase of the development. And that, that is our presentation. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Now we'll hear from the owner or the agent of the owner. Good evening. I'm Jeff Carter with uh, Carter Engineering, 3651 Mars Hill Road in Watkinsville. Um, I believe the the presentation that that we made a few months back um, stands on its own merit. This this property was uh, rezoned back in 1990. Uh, we've proven that all the uses um, that back then um, uh, are allowed by right now. So. Uh, all the uses that were that were asking to do on the property uh, was approvable back in 1991. Uh, for example, uh, the Walmart uh, here is Zone B1. All the restaurants in Butler's Crossing, for the most part, are Zone B1. So, all the uses back then are, are still applicable now, except for the zoning code has changed, and we feel like that um, that this property is is um, is very well situated in the county. Um, it's a very good place for it. Um, it with, uh, with all the houses that's coming in Westland, uh, I think there's 400 houses that are coming there. Um, this will be a good place for them to shop and not go down to Butler's Crossing, which we all, all know that Butler's Crossing is very jammed right now. And so this will this is uh, the 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 um, the county has looked this strategically um, in terms of where it would be a good place for a shopping center. And this is the, uh, a very good place uh, for it. So we appreciate your support and try to answer any questions that you that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak for? My name is Jeff Pittman. I'm with Piedmont Real Estate Group. I represent Don Hammond. I'm the developer of the property. On behalf of Mr. Hammond, I, I, I did want to mention one thing that the the berm that we've uh, proposed in the most recent site plan uh, is uh, probably the most significant berm that's ever been uh, proposed in this county and maybe in the state of Georgia in terms of its ability to separate the two uses. Uh, we don't want to overlook that, that that is, uh, I've never seen anything of this design before. I think Mr. Carter can verify that. Um, it's so uh, we've uh, come, I think, a considerable ways in trying to meet every objection uh, of the opposition to this this case. Um, we've spent an uh, inordinate amount of time uh, and funds to do that. We've redesigned the property four times. Uh, the current design uh, is a good design. And we're frankly, we're happy that we went through the process of doing this. We think we've got ultimately something that is going to benefit the county in ways that we didn't see at the beginning. And that includes uh, changing uh, really a, a, a concentration of strip retail and major stores into a, a, co a configuration with um, restaurant and service uses in the middle of the project. And we think that's actually much more current in terms of what the market's looking for. So we think in our desire is for this property to be a beacon in that area of the county and just deliver the very best possible result we can for development to really improve that area of the county. Uh, and I, I hope that the commissioners uh, can understand that uh, that vision is a very positive vision and a very attractive vision. And we think ultimately it's going to build a lot of traffic in a good way. Uh, it'll be a magnet for people uh, to bring their families, to enjoy the interconnectivity in the site. Uh, and really find a place to congregate in ways that uh, aren't typical in a project of this type. So for that reason, we're happy we went through the process and we, we think it's, it's going to be a great benefit and we would appreciate your support. Chair, I am Brandon Bowen. I represent the developer as well, and we would just reserve the remainder of our time to address any uh, comments you may. Thank you. Thank you. 
Now we move to those speaking against Stanton Porter. Okay, Rick, you want to come on up? Rick Caffrey, 1430 Oconee Crossing Circle. Good evening, Board of Commissioners, Holly, Justin, Daniel. Um, I can't honestly say that I'm happy to see you guys tonight, six short months after um, the vote in October, but here we are. I also want to thank all of our supporters, not only the Red Shirt Brigade that's here tonight, but also Oconee citizens at large, many of who have reached out to us in support, including the 800 plus folks that signed our petition last year. Uh, we've also heard from many people throughout the county that have expressed anger and frustration by the decision that we heard about six weeks ago where you guys have decided to settle with the developer without any significant change in the location of the grocery store. The optics aren't good. Um, you know, we were all so proud of you guys for protecting us in October from this Kennesaw developer. And now you apparently are acquiescing without so much as a fight. That's what it, that's what it seems like. <clears throat> it's very disappointing. Hey, Kyle, Kyle, can you put the map up for me? Kyle, is this the one from the first one? Yes. So, guys, this is the uh, this is the map that they presented in October, and let's not forget that. This isn't the map that they presented initially without any kind of um, cooperation or, 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 you know, working with, with the community. So we uh, originally the, what happened? Thanks. Originally the, uh, let's see, so this is Corporate Drive. This gentleman right here, this, this is where they live. They were going to put that grocery store right there. That's where it was going to be. The, the service end of that store was going to be facing their yard. We got them to move the store. We, we told them, look, the, the biggest issue, issue we have is the location of that store. Why can't you put this big old grocery store up here on 78? So they, um, you know, they, they took some of our ideas. Um, they incorporated them into a much better looking map. It's, it's going to be a lot, a lot more pedestrian friendly. We actually support this project if they would just move the grocery store up on 78. But instead, what they did is they moved it over here. So this is the second map, right? It's hard to tell. Yeah, it is, because there's that little. OK, so this is what they presented the board uh, in return to settling the, 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 uh, the lawsuit. And I mean, I just heard about this significant berm, one of the all time great berms in Georgia history. And it's going to go right in here, but they moved the store up 25 feet. So just to give you an idea, this wall to this wall is 23 feet. That's it. This gentleman right here, Paul, that lives, I think that's it right there, isn't it, Paul? So he's still going to be subjected. All these folks around this line are going to be subjected to a lot of noise, um, you know, the, the, the beeping of the trucks, which we're going to hear about here a little bit. It, it's not a significant change. And, and what I want to do, guys, is um, kind of refresh your memory, just sort of go back to the meeting in October. The reason um, that, they, that we were given for not moving that store is, and I quote Jeff Carter, business, timing, and process. That, those were the reasons. Um, when Mark Thomas asked Jeff Carter, and I quote, could the grocery store be moved up closer to where the four retail spaces are located or closer to 78 like the homeowners wanted? And Jeff Carter's response was, it is possible to move it closer to 78 from a design and engineering standpoint. So, you know, why won't they do it? <clears throat> when, um, when Chuck, Horton asked a guy, and he said, look, referring to 1990, if we were starting from square one, where this was 
typical HE property, we wouldn't do this, would we? In 1990, they did something we wouldn't do today. And Guy's response was, yes, sir. Chuck said, that's an issue I keep coming back to. We don't do these anymore. There would be some type of a buffer, maybe even another classification between B2 and, and a residential, right? And Guy's response was, yes, whether it's OIP or B1, typically that's what we would do. So right up in here, there typically there is nothing in Oconee County where you got a 52,000 square foot grocery store with the back end of it facing residences. That's the protection we have under B1. And you guys are looking to strip it away from us. And we just, we just, we just can't wrap our heads around that. <clears throat> um, in terms of the litigation, Amory Harden asked Mr. Haygood, does he have access to remedy through the courts? He being the, the uh, Mr. Hammett, remedy through the courts if he doesn't want to wait a year, because that was one of the options. He could wait a year like the folks at a Coney, Coney, a Coney Connector did, come up with a modified plan, hopefully come to the neighborhood, work with us. That didn't happen, so they sued the county, and Amory asked about that. Mr. Haygood's response was yes, but the reality is you can almost never get through the courts in a year. So a lot of times the smarter play is to continue to work towards something everyone can live with. Amory then said, has there ever been a situation where a judge crammed something down our throats that we didn't want? Mr. Haygood said, no. Long pause. We've had over the years very good luck defending what we've done. We get our litigators in harness and defend the lawsuit. Well, guys, that's what we want you to do. We just want you to defend the lawsuit. Let the chips fall you know, where they may with a judge. That's what we're asking for tonight. We're asking for you guys to please continue to defend us and stay with the convictions that you all had in October and not roll over for these guys. I also want to, one last quote from John Daniel. When John and Amory were exchanging some comments and John said, something to the effect back in 2009, when you first started, you had a huge case with even more people coming in, 441 in La Vista. And, Am and you, said, you said 441 in La Vista was similar, but the developer had to change. And Amory said, but as it turned out, Amory said, but as it turned out, they didn't get what they wanted or what they asked for, did they? And John, your response was no. We're just asking you guys to, to, to vote, to let this go on, to the courts. I mean, Mr. Pittman just talked about this is going to be a beacon. It is going to be a beacon. It's going to be a beacon in our neighborhood. It's going to be lights everywhere. We're willing to work with these guys. All we're asking for at this point is that they move that grocery store. You're talking about putting a grocery store over here off over closer to, to uh, Hog Mountain Road. And I know that uh, the, the thought is that maybe the service trucks, the, the tractor trailers are going to come in through here, I guess. But you know, doggone well, once those drivers figure out they can come in through Hog Mountain Road, you're talking about 15 to 20 tractor trailers a day. If, it's, if it is Publix, in fact, it's going to come in there, it's going to be about 15 to 20 tractor trailers a day. It's going to be a nightmare. So let the judge decide. That's all we're asking for. Thanks. Thank you. How much time do I have? 32. Okay. Um, good evening, Board of Commissioners. My name is Paul Bluda, 1660 Accounting Crossing Circle. I believe you should deny this request as you did in October. They moved the store 30 feet up. They added 25 feet of buffer, which at a first glance may seem like a huge improvement to you, but in reality actually makes almost no difference. And I will have the data and facts that prove that the service area cannot be abutting residential properties just what the current B1 zone says, the current one meaning next to myself. <clears throat> so I'm referring to the same um, protections that exist for B1, but do not exist for B2. 20509C4D section of the UDC code. Service areas, delivery areas, and dumpster areas shall be directed and located away from any residential side of the development, and in no case shall they be located directly between the building and the residential lot. In no case means in no case, and does not mean increased buffer or anything else. The language is pretty clear. Now let's establish some timeline. Those protections were added to the UDC code in 2019. As we haven't heard otherwise, Mr. Hammett accepted those changes 
the same year, because he didn't protest them, right? I purchased my house in 2021 next to B1 zone with those protections already in place. Please note that those rules in the UDC code itself do not contradict the future of a CONI plan. They do establish the guidelines of how things should be moving forward. Now, the most obvious fact with this plan is, or I guess the most screaming fact is that every single plan so far, and I mean it, every single plan is based on the removal of B1 protections when switching to B2. And I think it's an intent because in October, when you denied the plan, you actually questioned this exploit. You did but then they're submitting the same plan. And that's why there is an intent to use this removal of protections. So you see this, the small store here um, wouldn't work with B1. However, they make the store bigger. You approve the rezone on paper. You just change the number from one to two and suddenly this big store works. That's the magic of this unfortunately flawed UDC code as of right now. So I was looking for a word that describes what's happening here. And Cambridge Dictionary has a word for it. To exploit is to use someone or something unfairly for your own advantage. They are using the imperfections of the UDC code to unfairly remove existing protections from my property for their own advantage and you know, profit. How would I know? So I would ask you this question. In 2021, when I was buying my house, when I was investing the biggest investment in my life, how would I know that today, you would just remove those protections without proper reasoning and most importantly, proper consideration. When I mean proper, it has to have some, you know, a research or some knowledge that this buffer, you know, the best buffer, like they said, is gonna be enough. Now let's talk about civic center. I know it was, it was brought many times to their advantage. Like this, this area is supposed to be civic center, that's fine. But they never mentioned that one of the strategies of the civic center is this, protect existing neighborhoods from negative impacts. And there is another strategy for civic center. There should be adequate buffering between commercial and adjacent residential uses from light, sound, dumpster enclosures, and HVAC systems. So I ask you, please tell me how removing those protections from me and some neighbors actually align with those strategies of the civic center, which is part of the, again, the documents from Oconee County. We feel like we're being failed on every single level. First of all, it was the planning department who came up with a UDC code that flawed with some issues, but that's okay. Every document has some imperfections and there are people after all. Secondly, planning and staffing commissions, you know, didn't catch it and they pre-approved the, the original plan even though it contradicts common sense. And our case should have followed exactly the same exceptions as Mars Hills Road area where B2 actually has the same protections as B1. And now you board of commissioners, you're potentially closing your eyes on that by approving it. And I say that because you caught and questioned that exploit in October, 2022, which as you can see in, in the transcripts that I put on your tables and I sent through emails. So let's take a look at this new plan. Um, so they put some line of sight picture by questioning from the right beginning. And the reason is this building that they called my property, it's actually, well, my house is three times taller than this building. So this doesn't represent line of sight. This does not represent uh, the sound. It doesn't do anything. It's actually misleading. And I'm not sure if it's on purpose or not. So I went ahead and purchased the, um, the commercial beeper that's installed on trucks. The real one is connected to the battery. I'm not going to use it because it's, it's very, very loud. And then, and then I went 300 feet into the forest and did the test. And my wife was recording stuff from the inside and outside. But first of all, I want to say what Wikipedia says about these beepers. They are super loud. Brains do not adapt to the repetitive and persistent sound of backup beepers. The sound is perceived as irritating or painful, which breaks concentration. In some countries, backup warning systems using blasts of white noise have become more common. Well, great for those countries. And I believe that, and by the way, so we're gonna listen to some video pretty shortly, but I wanna tell you that, and as you know that, that I also have some videos from other properties, up to five houses. I want to, you know, ask for permission. And, you know, you can hear the sound as well. And one of those houses is as far as 500 feet away from the source of the sound. And when I went into the forest, I placed the beeper exactly where the trucks would be. So I can do my math and calculations, as you can imagine. So I can tell you that it's going to be unbearable. Plus, I can also tell you that my, my conditions were very favorable for the developer because keep in mind that 100 feet of the forest 
which I had in my test will be completely gone. And on top of that, my house will be exposed to the direct sound, which I will explain why, because it doesn't look like that, but I will explain why. So can we please play the video with a sound, hopefully, because that's the whole idea. So right now the windows are closed, just so you know, and my windows are brand new, but it's not through the entire house. And then my wife will open the windows. Okay, this doesn't justify it, but let's do it differently. Because this is, this is not fair really. Again, and if you don't trust me, you know, you're welcome to come, um, and we can do the test together, but that's how it's gonna sound. And again, it's very loud, honestly. But anyway, um, the developer's fix is to move the grocery store 30 feet up. I can tell you that from the calculations, those additional 30 feet will decrease the sound of the noise by less than one decibel. And you know, to simplify it, I guess, the real life loudness will only go down by about five to 7%. So if you thought in October that 100% of the noise is bad, why would you say today that 95% or even 93% is suddenly okay? Now, we're also dealing with three types of the sound. The first one is, how do I switch to the next slide? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Hmm? Yeah, it does. Oh, it did work. Okay. Sorry. Um, so the first sound type of sound is transmitted. It, it's the one that goes through the wall. The second one type is diffracted. That's the one that goes above the berm and above the fence. And the third type is the direct sound. And that's probably the worst, right? As you can imagine. So you would ask me, okay, Paul, how are you really ex exposed to you know, the direct sound? Well, it's easy. The wall of the store will be made of brick or concrete or some type of dense material. And if you Google it, it says that 100%, almost 100% of the sound will be reflected. So this wall, which is, according to my calculations, will be 35 feet tall, will become a sound reflector. And that's way above the fence. That's way above the berm. And that's how my house, by the way, this is how my house looks. It's again, it's even the second floor is twice as tall as this one. So I will be exposed not just to through some, uh, you know, uh, transmitted sound. This will be a direct sound coming to my way. You see, I'm talking about all these technical things. And this is where the sad truth is that there was no effort on the developer's side in terms of any research, any data, or anything that proves that their solution works. They just, I'm sorry, throw things at you and they hope that those things stick figuratively. But that's not how it works. And speaking of the you know, impact analysis, as part of the application process and as part of your approval process, according to the UDC code, the impact analysis was supposed to be done. That's how you make the decision. And I will remind you that from October, their impact analysis was this. There will be no negative effect on adjoining property values. That's it, nothing else. So if you don't approve this rezone request, you actually don't deny Mr. Hammett's rights to develop the land. You don't stop Mr. Hammett from rezoning part of his land or even the whole land as long as we as long as they follow the, um, those UDC protections that are currently in place. Now, I would say this, and I talked to multiple people. So if you were to pick up the best out of the worst solutions, I would say if you were to put a 30, 40 feet tall concrete wall, that the one that you sometimes see next to highways, it's not the best looking, unfortunately, but at least it works. That would be probably, again, the, the best out of the worst solutions to mitigate all of that. I also want to mention the car wash. Their plan is to put some um, trees around it to compensate for, I guess, the noise and everything. Well, there is a properly done research by the government of Canada where it says, it is a common misconception that planned vegetation such as a row of trees or shrubs can provide an effective barrier against noise. And I would encourage the developer to look at this research. It's an amazing research. It actually talks about the berms, how the berms don't really work that well because the sound wave will bend over and that's how it's gonna work. Now, I wanna also voice a few questions. I don't think you will ask them, but I wanna voice them anyway. Do you agree that there is not enough data and no research to say that the proposed concessions justify and compensate for the removal of existing B B1 protections from those properties like mine? Aside from the bigger size of the store, is it true that the reason this plan works 
is because B2 zone does not have and removes those existing B1 protections. Is it logical to say that B2 has more negative impact than B1 and thus removal of those existing protections contradicts common sense? Is it fair to say that your decision is actually administrative and does not change the nature of the problem, you know, of the noise, and that's why it does not justify the removal of those protections? Again, their plan is based on just one thing, and all of their plans have done just that. So please deny this rezoning request. Thank you. Okay, we have six seconds left if Skip Taylor wants to come up and say anything. No business uh, in any way uh, should be pushed, pushed aside the citizens and the taxpaying people of this county. That's the wealth of this county, not the businesses. It's the wealth of the human beings that decided to live here and live and raise their children and do their work. Thank you. So I, Time's up. Thank you. Would the applicant like some rebuttal? Uh, yeah, I would like just to, just to say a, a few things, a few comments. Um, I, I think lost in this a little bit is the fact that, um, and, I, and I, I know I'll, um, this will be a disagreement between us and the neighborhood, but this site plan has changed a lot. We've been through at least three major changes. I know my firm has worked hours and hours and hours on this, trying to move the grocery store where we thought people would be happy. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, after 25 years of being in this business, this developer has uh, backed down a lot. Uh, normally, I don't work with clients like this, but uh, there's more green space here. Uh, this, this is from the time that we started to where we are now, the difference in the quality of this development is, is a huge change. So I think it's a, it's a win for, for the county. Um, and and I, I just want you to understand how much this site plan has changed. The original 1990 plan that was on B1 had 172,000 square foot building up next to the property line. And I understand the concern about truck traffic and that sort of thing. But back in 1990 with 172,000 square feet there, that's a lot of trucks and a lot of traffic. And so it's a little different in that, you know, that's been on the table for many, many, uh, many, many years. Uh, as far as the, the berm, uh, Mr. Pittman mentioned uh, the significance of this, this berm. I will tell you that uh, this berm has been more of a focus for our firm than any other berm we've ever worked on, okay? It is 100 foot wide, uh, 50 feet. We started with 50, we added 25, and now we're at 100. And the original 1990 plan had a 25 foot buffer on there. Uh, so we have a hundred foot buffer uh, with a uh, opaque fence. We have a slew of evergreen trees and a bunch of trees that we're planting. We have a berm that we're putting there. Every, everything that I've ever worked on in my career in a berm is gonna be in this berm. Now I know it's not the end all be all and, and, and um, but at the end of the day, I, I just want you to know how significant, at least from my viewpoint, I'm not the owner, I'm not the developer, I'm the consultant here. Uh, this is, this is a very, very significant, um, uh, berm. I've never seen one like this. Um, and so, um, you know, as we said earlier, the building did move forward. Uh, we've looked at different locations for the, for the, for the grocery store. Um, and we've done our best to try to come to some reconciliation, but, um, uh, you know, we are where, where we are. Uh, as far as the car wash, for example, right now, they can put a car wash on this property. It's B1. You can go out there and put a car wash now. This doesn't, that type of application doesn't have anything to do with this, with this rezoning. And so um, I just wanted to make those uh, statements and I'm be glad to try to answer any any questions that you may have. Thank you.
Anything else on the rebuttal? Brandon Bowen again for uh, Mr. Hammett. Um, you know, I was not involved with this case back in October when when it first came before you all. Um, I've been involved since then and have come to know it since then. Um, my point when I got involved was to try to figure out what are the what are the reasonable concerns and how can we address those. And we've done everything we can to do that. And I, and I, I feel like Mr. Hammett did a lot to address concerns before I got involved, but after I got involved, we've done even more so. And again, the the berm that Mr. Carter has has uh, has designed, and uh, frankly, I've done zonings with heavy industrial uses that have much smaller berms than that. And that it is is the gold standard. If anything we can do to prevent any kind of uh, sound uh, pollution uh, or nuisance towards their, these neighbors. But the thing to keep in mind is that Mr. Hammond is a property owner here too. He's owned property for a long time here. Uh, when he bought his this property, what he's been trying to do is something he could do as a matter of right. And so he has property rights as well. So I appreciate all of you have been respectful of that and have given him concern and consideration. And uh, we we'll just ask that you approve this so we can put this to bed. Thank you. And with that, we'll go ahead and close public comments, open up to questions for commissioners. Chairman, I don't I don't have a question and I I certainly appreciate uh, the uh, effort by the uh, red shirt grade, is that what you call it, Rick? Uh, appreciate you uh, your efforts and and bringing your neighborhood together. Um, of course, the citizens of Oconee County are entitled to understand the reasoning behind my willingness to consider a settlement for this request. Um, when I first learned that a plan was going to be brought forth to develop this track, I was glad to hear the news. Uh, this track has had a concept plan in place since 1990 which had road frontage on two state highways. And uh, it was my belief then, and it is now, that it would bring much needed amenities to this part of the county. However, and I, I use the terminology version one, version two, and version three. Uh, when, I, when I saw the first version of this plan, I quickly had concerns about the proximity of the grocery store along the property line near uh, Corporate Drive. And even though all the neighbors in Oconee Crossings were aware that there was a retail and commercial designation for this adjoining track, version one was a significant departure uh, from the 1990 concept. Now, version two shows up the day of our meeting back on October 4th. And it addressed many of the concerns and truly was a much better plan. The question remained in my mind, though, is if the version two plan distances from the homes, especially the one at 1660 Oak County Crossing Circles, if it lined up with the 1990 concept plan, not having that information that night uh, prompted my no vote. And of course, all the red shirts helped too. Now, with the additional 25 feet that's being presented as part of the settlement, it is my view that the increased buffer and the enhanced screening within the buffer matches, and in some cases, it even exceeds the distances that were previously agreed to by this county in 1990 when this property was originally zoned uh, along with your residential component. And the, this fact, this fact mitigates my concerns. So that's my reasoning. I, I owed that to y'all because I was, I had a gag order. I'm sorry, Rick. They wouldn't let me respond. They said because of the litigation. I couldn't respond to the to emails that I received from you and from Paul. And I also got emails, my friends, from people who are supportive of this. 
that live in the dark corners of vicinity. Uh, they're not here tonight, uh, understandably, but they did express their support. So that, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to make that statement, but I think I owed it uh, to you all as citizens of this county for my reasoning. Thank you. Thank you. I'll agree with them. This has been one of the rezones are our toughest thing that we face here as being commissioners. Um, this was zoned in 1990. The re residential component only exists because of the the commercial portion of it. Um, this version is a lot better than the, the original one submitted. The and it's closer to the 1990 version that was approved as far as location of the of the bigger retail um, building. So. Say so. Yes, sir. Now, I really wasn't planning on saying anything, but I've said this many times. I've been doing this since my 15th year. I've seen a lot of rezones and lawsuits, uh, and those kind of things never really bothered me. You know, you get sued. I was a police chief too. I got sued personally. So, but, um, but I, I think I'll agree with John that these, these rezones tend to be. Some of the toughest things you have to deal with, you lose a lot of sleep, whether you did the right thing, you didn't do the right thing. But this one's a little bit different than some of the other difficult ones in that it was a PUD where it was designed, voted on, approved. And as I look at it, not saying that the current owner doesn't have a right to come and ask us for something. That doesn't mean he has to get. The second part of it is the homeowners bought the concept. That to me is very important. It was approved by the local government, and that's what it is. You you pay a lot of money for your property, um, and and you bought something that's in the clerk of court's office. You want to go pick it up. So I think any changes that take place, you have to really look at those folks who bought that concept. And, and they're not here just to take one for the team for somebody else down the street to go to the grocery store. So that makes it a little bit different. Uh, but again, it's tough on all of us having to, to do these because so much it is is with y'all. It's your home. It's Mr. Hammett's property. Uh, trying to come up with something. Uh, I wish there could have been more changes. You know, somebody I, being in police work, I've had people tell me all kinds of stuff. You know, but I deal with what I see and what is. Uh, I wish the grocery store had been closer to seventy eight. I wish it had been turned. And it's not. Uh, somebody can tell me all kind of, you know, engineer and this, that, and other. I don't care. I could care less. I'm not an engineer. Uh, but you know, we got we got what we got, and we'll have to vote. And the vote is what it is. So that's where I come from. It's not just somebody has some property. Let them do what they want to do with it. This was something people. Except it'd be like if I buy a piece of property with a chicken house next to it. I accept that. I'm not going to go make a chicken farmer move his chickens. So I, I think residences, and I know a few of you, I don't know all of you, I think. But it wouldn't make any difference if I knew you. If I didn't, if you wore green shirts, black with, it wouldn't make any difference to me. I, I think you bought a concept that was approved by the local government. And and when the government goes to change it, it better be good. So that's all I got to say. Any other questions or comments? We entertain a motion. 
Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we approve rezone P23-0087, Doe County County Board of Commissioners B1 to B1 and B2, 42.76 acres, uh, southeast corner of Highway 78 and Highway 53 uh, with the five condition as presented. Second. And we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? So the motion and the second is to approve rezone request P22-0087 with five conditions. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? No. Motion carries. No vote. One, three to one. Okay, our next rezone request is P22 0315 Moose Land Mars Hill LLC. Change in conditions of approval for case number 1967. It's 1 1.38 acres at 1030 Cliff Dawson Road. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, this is P220315 Moose Land Mars Hill LLC. This is located on parcel C02AE001 at Cliff Dawson and Mars Hill Road. It's currently zoned B1 in the Civic Center character area. And again, the request is to revise the conditions of the previous B1 rezoning, uh, which is rezone 1967, to increase the allowable building size from a maximum of 96,000 square feet to 10,600 square feet. This is the concept plan that you have in your application packets, slightly larger version. Uh, these are architectural images submitted with the application and staff uh, recommends conditional approval with our standard three conditions. Now we're here from the owner or the agent of the owner. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, member of the commission. My name is Rob Leverett. I'm from Elberton, Georgia, and uh, I think this is the first time I've had the pleasure of appearing before the commission. I'm here on behalf of the Applicant Brothers Company, LLC. Um, Director Herring, uh, as he did at the zoning meeting, has aptly summarized the the nature of our application. There was a rezone that was done back in 2000 of this pro property and the adjacent one that's been developed. There were certain conditions imposed as part of that zoning. And we'd like to change one of those conditions to increase the maximum square footage from 9,600 to 10,600. Uh, the reason is since the um, initial zoning was approved, the um, standards for uh, the uh, uh, surface water drainage and stormwater drainage have changed. And it, it doesn't appear that we would be able to do another uh, open air drainage on this property to tie into the other one. And instead, we're going to have to do underground uh, water retention, which is significantly expensive. You got to basically dig a big hole and put some large pipes and then connect them up to that other drainage facility. Additionally, there there will be a, a slope roof, uh, as, you, as you saw in the uh, plans. There, it will have gables, but it'll be a, a slope roof. And just due to those additional costs, we're asking to increase the square footage. That would significantly increase the uh, value of the project and our, accommodate the extra costs we anticipate incurring. Uh, we also believe the underground uh, water detention will be a lot more uh, pleasing. It's, you know, you don't see it, so it will be a lot more appropriate to that site as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jason Fritz. Does anyone else wish to speak for? Yes. Not for Mr. Chairman, but I'm afraid I, I failed to mention the Planning Commission's two recommendations. I apologize. Okay. Um, if I could just quickly go over those. Uh, the Planning Commission recommended approval with our staff uh, conditions, but also added two conditions. Uh, one, any and all retaining walls shall have a facade that matches the building facade. And number two, uh, keystone brick windows shall be installed along the sides and rear of the building. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anyone else speaking for? Anyone virtually? Okay, speak up against uh, Will Douglas. Good evening, uh, commissioners and staff. Um, long time listener, first time caller. Um, <laughs> we, uh, I, I live in Athens, but uh, own a nearby parcel on Cliff Dawson Road. Um, 1061 Cliff Dawson uh, office building there in the OIP zoning. Um, just a couple concerns uh, with the rezone request. Uh, one being the proposed access easement off of Mars Hill appears to be from an adjacent property owner. So I'm unclear on if that's already been agreed to or approved by the adjacent owner. And if it ultimately wasn't, um, how that would then impact Cliff Dawson traffic count and uh, only having the one ingress egress there uh, with also the Mars Hill district overlay being a part of this and the intent of that to protect the high quality commercial and also the residential development nearby um, and how that would affect if it was only off of Cliff Dawson. And then the precedent of this already having been rezoned from ag to B1 with an agreed upon conditions and amount. Um, it just seems to to set a bad precedent to rezone a rezone when the existing zoning, uh, to my knowledge and understanding, doesn't negatively impact the developer property owner and they have B1 zoning as it is. And so we'd just uh, like to ask the commissioners to, to take that into account as we try to have high quality uh, commercial and office retail along this Mars Hill district. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak against? Anyone virtually? Yes. Okay, we'll go ahead and close public comments and open up to questions from commissioners. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you want to say anything rebuttal wise? Yes, just okay. I could briefly. I appreciate the gentleman's concern. Um, the I believe the access is already arranged. It's in the it's in the site plan itself, and it was in the I'm sorry in the it's on title um there we are allowed access to the, the access road at the back of the development we have access across the other property to get to the right in right out uh access that's on uh, mars hill as well um and i i mean i think the drawing show this this would be i think a high quality uh development and as far as the argument about you shouldn't rezone a rezone i, I would agree if this were three or four years later, but it's been 20 years. And, and the reason, as I explained for that request of the additional square footage is because the applicable standards have changed, to which changes the requirements of the construction. So um, uh, we believe it's appropriate in this case. And while it is technically a zoning change, because we're changing that one condition, we are not changing the zoning classification of the property. It's going to remain the same. Thank you. Now we'll close public comment. And questions from commissioners. Chair, I had a, a couple of what may be questions or or or, or maybe some commentary uh, from the comments that were uh, given at the uh, planning commission meeting. Um, I know Commissioner Horton was in attendance, but I was on the Zoom, so I, I had I was listening in, um, and. Um, the, the applicant was specific that they do not have any tenants signed up for this property. Is that my understanding? There's no tenants. I believe that's correct. Okay, good. Now, what's unusual about this track uh, is that it's virtually visible from all four sides. So there's really not a back to this lot. Uh, in my opinion, but I travel by that numerous times a day. And um, so it, it's unique in that respect because it's going to be visible from Cliff Dawson Road as well as the Mars Hill Road. So there's some things that I thought from the conversation I heard from the Planning Commission, some of the suggestions that they had. Uh, I didn't get so much into the right the chain wall because I know that's a issue that they're going to have to deal with as far as the elevation, you know, because it's not a flat lot. So some there's some dirt has to be moved. 
I'm not so concerned about the retainer wall or how it looks, but I did have some issues about the uh, exposed wall. And I think they used the term, terms keystone brick windows. I'm not, I'm not a developer, I'm a banker. I don't know what a keystone window is, so please forgive me. But I think that uh, some of the things I wish my fellow commissioners would consider is that the wall here is on the ends of the building, uh, contains some uh, either window, glass windows or some sort of treatment to give it a depression in glass windows. Uh, I'd also would ask uh, consideration for a condition that would not allow any duct work to be visible from the adjacent roadways. Uh, now, I know that. Uh, you know, that's the trouble when you've got a building that you can see from all four sides. But uh, I think that it would uh, make it a better project if there was no duct work visible uh, to the adjacent roadway. Now, if you held a gun to me to tell you the difference between a hip and a gable roof, uh, I, I, I'd have to beg off. So uh, I know there's a discussion and that uh, Apparently, some people like the hip, hip, think the hip roof would be better than a gate. So that's that's for Mark Thomas and the others that know about that to, to speak to that. Um, I think that, um, you know, of course, concerns about signage. I just want to make sure that it adheres to our ordinances as far as, as well as the Mars Hill overlay, if that adds any additional protections as far as you know, I don't want flashing signs or, you know, things like that. But the other thing uh, that concerns me is from the discussion from the planning commission was uh, the use of the outdoor storage. And I asked our fellow commissioners if they would consider uh, prohibiting outdoor storage or outdoor display areas because of the uniqueness of this track. Now, the other thing, I'm glad y'all don't have any tenants because this is what another thing that I would like for the commissioners to consider is to prohibit certain types of uses for this for, uh, for this track, for this building. Uh, those would include, uh, you know, cigar and tobacco shops, vape and electronic cigarette, uh, used merchandise, uh, variety stores, general merchandise stores, gift vomities and souvenir stores and dollar stores. If uh, y'all would consider uh, prohibiting those uses for this, uh, with this approval of this rezone. And that's all I have for this, Chairman. I got something. Just a minute. Uh, can you kind of end? Uh, talk to us a little bit about the Morris Hill overlay, what protections, not just this property, but anything that comes in, kind of what. Right. So, so the overlay was put in place, right, to protect that corridor during the widening. And it was to protect um, both from a view shed, but also from, for the residential communities that are around, around that area. Um, so there were limitations on uses uh, that were uh, that were placed in the overlay district pro prohibiting certain uses, um, but then there was also special use requirements that were approved as well uh, in there. Um, so it, it it's not unusual that uses are restricted in in overlays uh, as you know uh, Commissioner Harden has suggested, um, and and we have done that in previous rezones. Um, but but the idea was to protect the corridor and then maintain its integrity and, and its higher quality. So going back to what Henry was talking about, um, there would not be any or you could no nobody could put like storage outside. That, that's right. That's right. That, yeah. That's that's yeah. covered by the overlay. So whether we condition it or not, it, it's. Again, that's right displays and overlays um it, it doesn't hurt to put those conditions in there in case the overlay ever changes um i, I still don't yeah. think that's a, an issue 
talk to me a little bit about the trash containers, large. Right. Yeah. So any dumpsters have to be screened, right? So so any dumpsters have to be screened. They cannot be next to a residential, and they cannot next be next to a roadway. So it it is a difficult situation uh, to find a location for a dumpster uh, on this site. Um, but in, in addition, it will have to be screened uh, by the, the masonry wall um, and uh, landscaping as well. Talk to me a little bit about signage. Um, so signage is is um, is covered in both the overlay, uh, the Marcel overlay, and in B1 um, standards, architect architectural standards. So uh, there are much greater restrictions in both of those than our standard sign ordinance. Um, so height limitations, uh, no internally lit uh, signage. It has to be externally lit, either down lighting, up lighting, that type of thing. Uh, so we do have greater restrictions um, in that in, in that than we do in the, the regular sign ordinance. <clears throat> Let's talk about the uh, gable and the hip roof. And so the architectural images are showing that it's obviously what? Gable. A gable roof. Okay. <laughs> and that answers your you question. You didn't need a gun. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't need so reading the narrative, the narrative does say that it needs to be a hip roof, uh, according to Mars Hill Overlay. And so in terms of our rezone, which takes precedence, the verbiage that is written or the yeah, images? So, so the images, we would go by the images. When we review the sign, the, the building permit that's submitted, the architectural that's submitted with it, we would go by the image. And and like you said, the overlay would allow either, right? But, but we have to have a pitched roof that's either gabled or hip. Okay. So let me ask, in terms of, since this is here and this was presented, <clears throat> and we know that it, it should be a, a hip roof and how we get to the point of changing that. Is it going to be a condition? Right. It, it, okay. it, and so the overlay would allow either the gable or the hip. So if, if we desire, if the board desires to change it to hip, you certainly can do that as a condition. I got four wrote down. I got four because the sign you the sign you saw the address right. Yes, the sign you saw the address. Six doesn't make it six. Could you go the one was about the end, the the wall areas on the end. As far as being something other than just a wall, and I think I heard suggested that the pen condition the uh, windows, and I think a uh, guy has suggested at least a minimum of twenty percent of the wall be some sort of window treatment. That was one of the conditions uh, that I put forth. The other is that no gut work be visible from adjacent roadways. Uh, the third one is, is the hip roof could be incorporated instead of the gable. Uh, the fourth one was that outdoor displays and outdoor storage be prohibited. Now that may already be the case, but as Guy said, he may want to go ahead and include that as a specific condition. And also to prohibit the fault, those uses that I had mentioned, uh, the cigar and tobacco stores, the used merchandise stores, variety stores, uh, gift novelty and souvenir stores, general merchandise stores and dollar stores. So those along with the other conditions that the planning behind that the staff had recommended. Okay, I'm sorry. And so really one of those would replace number two. That's right. 
I could make sure I understand uh, sort of what's being proposed. So one proposed condition would be to require that 20% of all walls be covered with some kind of window treatment or just in wall. Yeah, the end. The end walls. And that would be in the in the uh, rendering the wall that has the gable. Right. Whatever is visible, but we have to look at it every day. Okay, so every wall then. Well, I, I would assume storefronts won't have more than the door. I would, I would think so, yeah. but but I still want to understand the condition. Yeah, that's what we got to live with okay. uh, legally. If it's if it's you know uh, to your point. I think we're fine with these conditions, but I just want to make sure we understand them going forward. Um, no outdoor, uh, I think there's no storage, which I think is already covered, but we're, I don't think we have any objection to that condition. Um, the hip and changing it from a gable roof to a hip roof, I think, is one condition too. So that would change what's on the plan we presented. Um, and then, um, no duct work. No duct work visible. That I, if I could turn my clock, ask about that. So there would be some duct work. I mean, again, unless you bury the duct work, it would be good. You can't go in. Is that Mr. Pinscher what you had in mind? I, well, I think I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah. We'll go back over the whole list after we finish our discussion. Go well, I, I would just like the opportunity for a little input before you make up your mind. Uh, yeah. so that's what I was just concerned about. And and so I would my point out was the gut work being visible from the roadway. That was okay, and I and I think I understand that. I'm just trying to find out the, the scope of that. I'm I'll let God enforce it. <laughs> <laughs> and and I would note that the existing zoning already prohibits a number of uses yeah. itself, um, and it includes bait sales, builders' equipment, material storage, bus terminal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's got a number of, of restrictions as well. Right. So we'd be we'd be making a rather robust list of uh, prohibited uses. And of course, uh, I, I don't know that we have a, a huge problem with, with most of these, but uh, you're just always nervous when you're well, you're fact, limiting your options yeah. of what you can do with property. Since you don't have any tenants yet, I, I felt it's better to do that tonight. Uh, well, yes, it just, I guess there's a concern on our part about that sort of limits the ability to, to find one. <laughs> Unless, the commissioner is interested in commercial space. <laughs> so, all right, thank you. Thank you. You want to speak to him? Yes, sir. Um, you guys just mentioned something about the duct work is required on the outside. So, speak to the type of unit that you're going to use. Yeah. Obviously, it's going to be a package unit as opposed to a split unit. Package unit on the ground. It has to be duct unit. Okay, so why would you not use a split unit? Not that I, I beg to differ um, with you on that. If you, we can, I can show you different tables. You can get better efficiency with a split unit than you can with a package. Um, so that's really personal choice. And your personal choice would be to have ductwork on the outside of the building. But there are other options. You can put split units in. And they would be the same efficiency or better. Just deal with what I think is dollars. Okay. Well, I have a license in that, so I understand that pretty well. Okay. All right. So if I understand where we are, there were three original conditions in condition number one from the Planning Commission. It appears we have five additional. First one being a minimum of 20% of all wear areas, all wall areas on the ends of the building shall be glass windows. Is that right? Okay. 
No duct work shall be visible from the adjacent roadways. Hip roof shall be incorporated instead of gable. Outdoor display areas and outdoor storage is prohibited. And the following uses shall be prohibited. Cigar and tobacco stores, including vape shops and electronic cigarette stores, use merchandise stores, variety stores, dollar stores, general merchandise stores, and gift novelty and souvenir stores. Is that what is that right? Is that right? I think that would be nine total because the, the condition number two by the planning commission would be replaced by your first condition. You wouldn't need the rock accent or brick accent to make it look like a window if you actually had one. You'd have to have glass, I believe. So you could, I guess you could still brick it and just put a, I don't know. I, I can't design a building, so. <laughs> so you also have all of the uses that were on the original zone proposal. Yes. I, I, just to preserve our rights, I would say we don't, of course, don't object to the original zone because we object to adding all these new uses to these concerns. If we don't have a picture, it might be hard. Understood. Understood. Thank you. Feel comfortable with my wording on the, not, you're good with them. So I, any other questions or comments on that? No, I'm just, something just struck me. I've had some experience. It's not uncommon for the additional conditions that we placed on use to be on some other rezones that we've done. No, no, sir. No, sir. Yeah. Same. So yeah, conditional way. zone is used often and use restrictions are used often in this yeah, county. And some of the ones we put in, we those have been used in the past. Yeah, that's right. Sure. Thank you. Yes. Sir. All right, I guess we'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion for the approved rezone P220315 Mooseland Mars Hill LFC change conditions approval for case number. 1967, 1.3 acres, 1035 Dawson Road, with nine conditions. Second. Here we have a motion and a second to approve rezone request P22 0315 with the nine conditions as presented tonight. In discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Just, just as a matter of uh, courtesy and, and personal privilege. I think we ought to recognize that uh, Representative Absolutely. Leverett has uh, made an appearance tonight and thank him for his service. And uh, also say he's a friend of mine because we're both local government lawyers and we see each other at seminars and things. So it was, it was fun to see you at work tonight, Rob. Thank you. And he was a real champion this this round to try to get the uh, soil amendments uh, handled as, as well as some truckway work. So we appreciate your work on that as well. Unfortunately, I had as much success getting that built as I had keeping those people. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a question, Mr. Chair? Was, was your father Freeman? Yes. Okay. I knew him. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very much. You come from good stock. Thank you. Yeah. Next rezone is P23 0043 KBB LLC. It's going from AG to AR3, 7.82 acres, southeast corner of Highway 53 and Bishop Farns Parkway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, again, this is P23-0043, KBB LLC owner. Uh, this is parcel B06022F. It's currently zoned to AG in the Civic Center character area. And again, the request is a rezone from AG to AG and AR3 to create two AR3 tracks 
and then the remaining track would be AG uh, for state planning purposes. This is the concept plan that you have in your uh, packet. And uh, staff recommends conditional approval over our standard three conditions and planning commission recommended approval uh, with staff conditions. Thank you. All right, Robert. You probably could have gone across the street. <laughs> I think I could have. I think I could have, gentlemen and ladies. Um, Robert W. Bishop, 1130 Trailwood Drive, Watkinsville, representing KBB LLC. Uh, any questions? We're good. <laughs> we may ask you to come some in just a minute. Okay. All right. Thank All right. you. Pretty forward. straightforward. Yep. Does anyone else wish to speak for the rezone? Does anyone wish to speak against? Anyone virtually on either? No. Thank you. With that, we'll close public comments. Any questions from commissioners? We'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion. Do this right now. Um, can we do it? No. Here. I got them now. I, I, I just got to get it <laughs> Approve rezone B23 0043 KBB LLC AG to AR3 residential, uh, 7.82 acres southeast corner of Highway 53 and Bishop Farms Parkway, agricultural use precondition. Second. All right, I have a motion and second approve rezone P23 0043 with three conditions. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Next item is. I would like to say one thing to Mr. Bishop. He, what, what? he, <laughs> had, he had he had here when he was playing with shortstop for me. <laughs> you didn't do it. You still didn't have here. <laughs> I didn't have much, and I lost it dealing with you. <laughs> so he's a good <laughs> The next rezone is P23-0051. It's Triple C Family Limited Partnerships going from AG to AR. It's 10.03 acres at 2371 Cold Springs Road. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, again, this is P23-0051, Triple C Family Limited Partnership. This is a, a portion of parcel A05002. Uh, it's currently zoned AG in the Rural Places Character Area. And again, the request is rezone the property from AG to AR and AG for a proposed uh, four lot minor subdivision. These are the four lots uh, proposed to rezone to AR. Slightly larger. Uh, staff recommends conditional approval with our three standard conditions. Planning Commission also recommends approval with the same conditions. Thank you. Uh, Ken, you want to present? I'd like to just say any questions, but I got a, a little bit more I better talk about on this. I'm Ken Bell, Bell and Company, um, 1041 Lake Wellbrook Drive, Oconee County. And um, I've been working for quite a while with Mr. Crenshaw over the years, going back 17, 18 years. He came and met with us uh, about designing the entrance to his estate and uh, doing the planting plans, and walkways and many other uh, fun things to work on over the years. But he never asked me to do any subdivision work, which is the main reason why I come before y'all most of the time, subdivision and zoning. And that's what I'm here for tonight. So finally, after about 17 years, uh, he came to me about a year and a half ago and said, Ken, I want you to find 12 lots out of my 700 and plus acres that I can give to my grandchildren. And so I said, well, let me do some thinking about that. And I'll see what I can come up with. So I look, he has been over the years acquiring multiple properties. And that's how ultimately now he's gotten up to about 740 acres but in all that time he hasn't subdivided any of it except maybe for building his own personal house on the property i think he had to subdivide out some of it 
Um, and that's about it. So um, what he wanted me to do is figure out where we could place lots that he could give to his grandchildren. And so after assessing the entire project, I figured out that we can do all 12 of those lots and only four of them would have to require a rezone. And so these are the four that would require the rezone. So we're going from AG to AR. So these happen to be on Cold Springs Road uh, and it's basically right across the street uh, to the entrance of Lane Creek Golf Course, which is also zone AR. But those lots are more on the 30,000 square foot range to an acre and a half, where we're proposing two and a half acres, uh, which is the minimum size that he wanted to have to be able to give to his grandchildren. So we, we're calling this a legacy subdivision just because everything is staying in the family. So there's no desire to sell anything out there. So it's not being done to raise money for any reason whatsoever. Not there's anything wrong with that, but this is just to create a legacy. This is four of the 12 lots I've got to figure out on the rest of this estate. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have about it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak for? Anyone virtually? I'll we'll move those who want to speak. It. You may want to speak against Julian. Signed up. Do you want to say anything? Hey, how you guys doing today? My name's Julian. I live at fourteen eighty four Club Filter Road on Borgo, Georgia, and um, this is my first time here. I wanted to meet everybody here and kind of get a good sense of how everything works. Um, but when I seen the rezone here right in front of Lane Creek, um, I thought it was going to be a lot of houses. But since he said it's four. Um, I think it's fine, um, especially if it's a, you know, legally legacy, whereas uh, grandchildren, I think it's fine. Um, I just want to make sure it wasn't a lot of homes, you know, because I like Oconee County to be nice and uh, subtle and, and peaceful, you know, so Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. Anyone wish to speak against? Anyone virtually? Yes. Okay. We'll go ahead and close public comments. Any questions from commissioners? We'll entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve rezone P230051 Triple C Family Limited Partnership AG to AR 10.03 acres 2371 Cold Springs Road at Culturewood. Three conditions. Second. You have a motion second to approve rezone request P23 0051 with three conditions. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Next time is special use 23-0052 is EA3 Investments LLC. It's changing conditions of approval for case number 4639. Special use approval for residential amenity lot in the AR zoning district, 415.48 acres on Treadwell Bridge Road. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, again, this is P23-0052, EA3 Investments LLC. Uh, there we go. It's uh, a portion of parcel A. 02E001. Uh, they're requesting special use for an amenity center. It's currently zoned AR in rural places. And again, the applicant's requesting special use approval to construct a residential amenity lot under the existing AR zoning. This is a principal use as allowed as it's by special use approval in the AR zoning district according to previous conditions on the property. Uh, this is the proposed location of the lot, uh, the amenity lot in the subdivision slightly larger version. Some of the amenities, um, notice pickleball is one of them uh, at the facility. Um, staff recommends conditional approval uh, with three standard conditions and planning commission recommend approval of the same conditions. Thank you. And now we hear from the owner or the agent of the owner. Good evening, my name is Ben Crew with Smith Planning Group. Uh, and also resident of Madison, um, just representing the, the owner here. So th this larger property, uh, it's roughly about 10 acres that's being uh, the ask for to be a special use permit for recreational use and amenity for the development called North Haven. Um, back in 2005, the larger property was rezoned. Um, and this was Oconee's uh, County's ask was that uh, some amenity would be provided uh, for the community. So, uh, 
So that's kind of merely the, the client just trying to meet those conditions. Um, do want to point out there are two phases uh, to this development. Uh, the first phase um, is currently under review. Uh, the amenity lot is located within the second phase. Uh, and upon approval of this, that second phase would go, uh, their construction documents would be submitted for review. Um, as you can see, uh, the, the amenity lot is uh, interior to the larger parcel uh, and adjacent to uh, basically uh, Walton County. Um, happy to answer any questions that may come up. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak for? Anyone virtually? Does anyone wish to speak against? Anyone virtually? Yes. We'll go ahead and close uh, public comments, open it up to questions. Okay. I'm just curious, Guy, remind me, how many lots are in this development? Um, I do not know off the top of my head. The applicant might. Applicant, I'm sorry. It, it, it's, there are still clients coming in about one. In, in both phases? Yes. Okay, 160. All right, thank you. Yeah. No other questions. We'll entertain a motion. I'll uh, be glad to make the motion to approve the special use P23 0052 for EA3 Investments LLC for the chain of conditions. Approval for case number 4639, special use approval for residential amenity lot in the AR zoning district for 415.48 acres on Treadwell Ridge Road with the uh, conditions as presented. Yeah. Three. Second. We have a motion and second to approve special use P23 0052 with three conditions. in discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Now ready for some text amendments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, commissioners. Um, you have in your application packets. Can you enlarge that? Can you full size on? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, you have in your application uh, packets some proposed uh, UDC amendments. I'll go over those briefly. Uh, Planning Commission did recommend approval of these proposed amendments. Um, Article 2, we're proposing to revise Table 2.1, uh, Principal Uses Allowed by Zoning Districts to Combine Pet Care, Grooming, Boarding, and Training uh, with the exception of Veterinary Services Uses. So that would be in Section 20707. Uh, number 2, Update Table 2.2, Accessory Uses Allowed by Zoning District to Allow Personal backyard hen flocks in R1 zoning. That's section 20707 also. Article three, uh, number three, detail the minimum lot size requirements for breeding versus boarding kennels and include requirements for pet sitting. Um, and we'll go over those briefly in just a minute. Uh, number four, require the roof pitch for one story mini warehouses to be 412 unless otherwise approved by the board of commissioners. Number five, remove the moratorium on timber harvesting. Number six, revise the dead end streets cul de sac design standards so that specific street length is no longer included in the dead end street requirements. That's section 100804. Number seven, modify residential subdivision entrance requirements such that the entrance streets with 10 lots, such that entrance streets with 10 lots or less and meeting all other requirements do not require a deceleration lane. That's section 101302. Number eight, clarify the projects that were final platted prior to the code change in 2019 will not be subject to the sidewalk requirements in the co current code, uh, which is section 101402. Number nine, add a waterline exemption in major subdivisions with 10 lots or less and a minimum lot size of five acres or greater so that those major subdivisions have the option to use wells or water service at section 101602. You have in your um, application, uh, in your packets, the examples of each of these, um, and I'll be glad to go over those if you have any questions. Any questions from Commissioner? I have one um, in Article 2, the one that's uh, speaking to the backyard chickens. Yes. Can you scroll down to that one, please? <clears throat> Uh, 
No, I think it's I think it's back up in the tables. Is it number two? Scroll down. Thanks. Right there. Yep. Backyard hen flock personal, uh, where we you notice we changed the uh, we added an allowable uh, in R one. Right. And uh, so my question is, is that I think the some of the lot sizes in R one may be a little less than an acre, and I think the parameters are basing this on an acre. So uh, would it be a would it be appropriate to allow five? five chickens per lot for lots that are less than an acre and then lots that are larger then have it on a scale of basis based on the sure the lot it, amount. It, it, we can do that the um the requirements are right now you can have a, a maximum of five chickens per acre right so so what that does right yeah if you have a lot that's less that's sub acre one acre then it, it's it's a chicken and a half or whatever. So nothing special speaks. <laughs> great. So um so yeah, that's that's certainly appropriate. So each lot could then a, a lot, if it's less than an acre, could have five chickens. And then any lots that are over an acre would have would have to maintain that standard of five per acre. Yeah. Yeah. So if they had two acres, then it'd be two chickens. Yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> Roosters are not allowed. Thank you. Thanks, sir. So you recommending that change? Okay. Any questions or commissioners on that? Any concerns? Okay. Uh, do we have any public comment on these text amendments? Anyone virtually? No. Thank you. With that, we'll entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve the text amendments as submitted with the one change. Second. Anyway, motion second to approve text amendments with the change discussed tonight. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Melissa, come on up. Next item is process. Presentation of the FY24 budget proposal. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, Commissioners. <laughs> I am here to present the FY24 budget proposal, uh, which would go into effect on July 1st, 2023, and carry us through June 30th of 2024. Uh, do want to just cover the county's mission statement and let you all know that as we work through the budget process, we do strive to make sure that the budget is achieving the county's mission uh, to provide high quality services in a fiscally responsible manner uh, to Oconee County citizens, um, and also to design the budget with the strategic goals of the county in mind uh, to support growth of infrastructure and high quality services in the government. Without further ado, uh, the FY24 general fund proposed budget it's $38,834,959. Um, this represents the revenues and expenditures. So we have a balanced budget at this amount um, to carry out uh, the mission and strategic goals. So just a quick reference for you, uh, comparatively to about this time last year at 37.8 million and currently proposing 38.8 million an increase of $940,000 at about 2.5%. There is much more uh, to the story than the 2.5%, so we'll take a look at it in more detail. Uh, proposed revenues, as compared to, um, on the right-hand side, our current year FY23 amended budget, and this is presenting the revenues by sources. And then on the left-hand side, you have a chart that shows you the percentage of each source compared to the general fund proposed budget. And so you can see that property taxes are 47.4% of the proposed budget, local option sales tax at 27.4%, and other taxes at 11.7%, with the remaining budget comprised of charges for services, permits, licenses, grants, fines, and other fees. Uh, looking at the changes by revenue source from 23 to 24, 
you can see that there is actually a decrease in property taxes. That decrease is related to uh, the one mill reduction that the board committed to uh, with the passage of T-SPOS. Uh, that net overall reduction is $1.9 million. And local option sales tax, the second largest component of revenue for the general fund, um, is increasing approximately $1.6 million related to a combination of new developments in the county um, and also growth in the tax itself. And the other revenues are fairly not flat, but they they have smaller increases um, in the 24 proposed budget, um, with the exception of um, interest income, investment income, um, which was higher than anticipated in 23. We did um, increase from our original budget in 24, um, but we didn't jump to where we're currently at right now. Um, as you know, that is subject to change, and we don't want to over and overstate the revenues. So looking at expenditures, you can see the expenditures um, by what we call function. Um, so if you can think of that as kind of the departmental um, costs of operating. Law enforcement, jail, and E911 make up the largest percent of our general fund budget at 28.5%, followed by administration and operations at 17.5%. Also by public works at 11.9%. Um, we'll talk about these um, kind of by classification in a moment and look at areas of spending, but just to mention the few that have the largest changes between years, law enforcement, jail, and E911 has an increase of approximately $735,000 related to personnel changes. Administrations and operations actually decreases, and that is related to uh, the administrative building being budgeted in the current fiscal year and hopefully complete before the next or close to it. And public works, you will see um, a decrease as well. And that is related to TSPLOS funds, um, funds may, being moved over to the TSPLOS funds from the general fund to offset that reduction in property tax revenue. Okay, so as um, I mentioned looking by classification, kind of what are we spending the general fund dollars on? Um, our largest cost is personnel and benefits at 54% of the general fund budget. You can see an increase um, in this line item from prior year. So just like to mention a few things that we've placed into the budget for your consideration. Um, we do have um, an increase in the base level staffing charts of $2,500 and budgeted step increases for employees who qualify for the increases, along with additional positions, an administrative receptionist, a part-time position in elections moving to a full-time elections assistant, two property tax registrars that are part-time, and four deputy sheriffs in law enforcement. Following to operations <clears throat> and maintenance at a 27% of our general fund budget, you do see that number decreasing. And again, that's because of paving activities moving over into this lost fund. Capital outlays, 2% of the budget. Payments to other agencies at 3%. Debt service at 6%. And support of other funds at 2%. Uh, so showing the total budget of the $38.8 million. And just to look at capital specifically from the general fund, um, we have IT call manager upgrade, uh, our fleet maintenance, um, life cycle management program, uh, jail control systems for the HVAC, public works infrastructure, and park facilities equipment. All right, and moving past the general fund for a moment, looking at the total proposed budget of $75 million, $18,615. The total proposed budget includes the general fund, in addition to SPLOS, capital, special revenue, and enterprise funds. So comparatively to prior year, it's an increase of 9.1 million, bringing us a 13.87% increase. And that increase is related um, to the T-SPLOS budget. The T-SPLOS budget in and of itself is um, $10,566,150.
looking at total proposed revenues, you can see that property taxes are 25% of our total budget, with water and sewer revenues coming in at 19.2%. It's one of our enterprise funds illustrated in the total budget. Local option sales tax, 14.4%, TSPLOS 14.3%, and SPLOS 9.5%. So in combining all of the local option sales taxes, it brings our total sales taxes to 38.2% of the county budget. You can also notice here, um, the total of the proposed is 70, let's see if I can read this, 73,638,964. On the previous screen, the number was at 75 million. So the total revenues budgeted is actually less than total expenditures. So the plan is to use fund balance um, for some of the funds, um, such as SPLOS. Collections are in prior period, but we plan to spend some of those in this current period. Um, the same thing happens with grant funds and special revenue and in our water resources department as well. So illustrating the expenditures by those departments as well. Uh, water resources expenses, 20.5% of the total budget. Public works is at 14.8% of the total budget. Jail, law enforcement, and E911 at 16.1% of the total budget. All right, the capital fund um, is in a fund in addition to the general fund that has capital contained in it. Um, we are working in the new fiscal year to reserve the capital fund uh, budget for long-term projects that cross multiple fiscal years and reserving one-time capital purchases um, in the general fund. So for our capital fund in FY24, we're starting with county facilities of $250,000. Uh, that's related to the administrative building um, in the event that they're is a rollover of that project and funding is needed in next fiscal year. And also life cycle management programs for law enforcement and public safety, um, communications upgrades and safety equipment. It's plus 2015. Um, the only referendum line item that we anticipate having at the start of FY24 uh, remaining is historic and scenic facilities, uh, $102,500. Our SPLOS 2021 is our current active SPLOS that is still in collections. And so from that, we are planning um, on debt service from our parks geo bond and our administrative facilities geo bond. Paving at $2 million, uh, county facility improvements at $345,000. You'll notice we don't have any law enforcement vehicles budgeted for FY24. Um, if you recall recently, we did an amendment in 23 to go ahead and purchase those vehicles because they were actually on the lot and we did not have to wait for them to come in. So you'll see that a couple of more times with the no value budgeted. Fire rescue vehicles and equipment. Uh, we do have a um, pumper truck that was approved and ordered in FY22 and we believe that it will be um, ready for receipt in FY24 at 600,000, along with additional equipment for fire and rescue at 277,300. So a total of 877,300. Water and sewer facilities, we've uh, placed in $100,000 for land acquisition, um, if needed for an Epps Bridge pump station project, and distributions to the municipalities from SPLOS receipts. And the first time I get to present a budget to you for t 2023 is effective on April the 1st. Um, so we should get our first full distribution in May. So we haven't collected on it yet, but we are budgeting for paving of 6 million, related services of just over 3 million, and then the payouts to the municipalities per the intergovernmental agreement. The related services, um, well, not entirely paving, um, also have minor paving repairs included, um, and other things such as professional services, roadside care, and non-paved road improvements as well. Another large fund of the total budget um, is our enterprise fund, the Water Resources Department. The proposed budget is fifteen million three seventy one seven zero one, with a decrease of approximately six percent. So you can see the revenues on the left and expenses on the right. 
total revenues budgeted 14,266,000 while expenses are budgeted at the 15,371 sorry 15,371 this is another instance where we're using fund balance from prior years to complete um, the FY24 expenditures and that um, is in that capital outlay um, section where that fund balance is being used. So the wastewater appears to have a decrease in revenue. Um, while the revenue is increasing, we do have a decrease in SWAS that's allocated to water resources. So that's the apparent reason for wastewater decreasing. Um, sewer sales actually are budgeted to increase along with water sales. Um, expense classifications. Um, really across years, um, it is a minimal increase. Um, the personnel and employee benefits are um, receiving the same increases that were mentioned in the general fund. Operations and maintenance is fairly flat. Uh, capital outlay is decreasing substantially from the FY23 amended budget. Um, FY23 contains the budget for a Calls Creek project. Uh, that budget was approved as a multi-year capital project. And so the balance of that project will roll into the next fiscal year um, once FY23 has completed. So that project will continue. All right, so we'd like to take a second to show you how um, we are using this budget to meet the strategic goals that were presented using commitment to public safety, transportation, water and sewer and fleet, play, fleet phase replacement program. The public safety is 41% of our general fund budget. You can see the chart on the right demonstrating all the different components of public safety. Um, those components are shown as uh, our total budget and showing the operations component and the capital components that make up the public safety. And just to go down a few items that were requested and proposed in the budget for public safety, uh, we have building maintenance for uh, law enforcement, the administrative building, building the jail, and E911. Um, investigations um, is receiving additional cameras. Uh, the law enforcement um, group is supported by equipment of armor, rifles, pistols, car cameras, and lasers each year. The jail uh, is requesting uh, 10 additional cameras inside the jail to make sure that they can monitor everything that's needed. The courthouse um, is receiving um, additional secured access by the key card system. Um, E911, E911 radios are included along with um, life cycle management funding for their um, CAD communication system program and sheriff officers body camera systems. Uh, includes as well animal services building, um, maintenance and improvements, and support of general fund match um, to a breathing air machine that was uh, we received grant funds for. Transportation, maintenance, and improvement. We are looking at total paving budget in FY24 of $9.1 million. Uh, prior year was 4.9 million. So you can see that green area in the chart is the increase related to T SWAS that was voted and approved. Uh, so Public Works uh, makes up 20% of the total budget. Uh, the proposed capital for the enterprise fund supporting uh, the water uh, and sewer infrastructure um, gives you a list of what we anticipate we'll be working on in FY24. Um, current projects not on this list, but that will roll into the future year, already mentioned, um, includes Calls Creek, Phase 1 and 2 construction. Uh, our philosophy with the Water Resources Department is as projects are ready to be initiated, they would come to the Board of Commissioners, and if approved, then we would request budget amendment to include those funding sources for the project. We also do have one piece of equipment recommended for them as well, a uh, mini excavator there at the bottom of the list. And our fleet phase replacement program, uh, we talked about the fire septum pumper and the um, county's fleet of $205,000 consists of uh, vehicles for um, road department, parks, and fire. Um, and those are part of the replacement where when we add a vehicle, we also dispose of and sell a vehicle. Um, and law enforcement, again, is not budgeted for since the purchases were in FY23. 
Our current schedule is May 23rd to have our first public hearing, June 6th to have our second public hearing along with the budget adoption. Um, and if I can take a second just to thank all of the departments for all of their work that they put into this budget and for meeting with us and administration and their time um, and for finance for their support and all of the work that went into it. And thank you for your time. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to take them. Any questions from Melissa? So all these items along with the fee schedule will be posted to the website. Um, citizens go out and look at that and again our next our public hearing will be on may the 23rd so i'll give everybody time to digest it and come up with questions and comments but again thank you to melissa for great presentation and a lot of hard work to get us to this area does any commissioner wish any item to be removed from consent okay we'll entertain a motion make a motion with approval percentage agenda submitted sorry Motion is second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. We have no need of an executive session. Commissioner Sachs. Motion adjourned. Sachs. We are adjourned.